everybody and welcome to my latest tutorial um, demo tutorial um, in this particular case I decided to start something uh, different I wanted to throw a bit of a curveball because I've been doing a lot of character work lately and I've been doing stuff that's a little bit more refined a little bit tighter and I decided to just you know uh, do a 180 and do something that was had a very different feel, a very different approach, a very different technique. Um, but uh, um, I found it, I found it really exciting working this way. It really kind of loosened me up a lot and got me. Uh, I had a chance to really nerd around with a lot of different things. Um, so as you can see, I'm, do, I'm starting off what is to be uh, primarily an environment piece. Of, it's an illustration. It is a full illustration, but it's an environment-centric piece. It's, a, it's an environment-focused piece. Uh, now the idea, uh, the inspiration behind this was posted uh, either in my forum or on the YouTube page. I can't remember exactly where, where I read it. I'm going to have to go and check it out. Uh, I'll make a mention for sure, whoever, uh, whoever mentioned this. Uh, afterwards uh, just once I go and check it out after recording this um, but uh, somebody had mentioned had made a comment it would be cool to see a steampunk village uh, and I thought that, that's I didn't actually read it further than that I went oh good idea and I immediately closed my my browser and opened up Photoshop and just got cracking on this piece so um, uh, before I started to paint this, before I started to block in these shapes, you see I'm taking a very uh, value speed painting type of approach to the beginning, just to flesh out the composition and see, you know, the type of feel and mood and atmosphere I wanted to inject into this piece. Um, uh, was what kind of inspirations did I get? Now, uh, later on, the, this first part here, uh, the, this, this pr uh, part one and maybe a little bit into part two is um, as you can see it is sped up um, this is three times the actual speed so this is 300 percent uh, speed so this entire first part altogether took about three hours to complete uh, it's not the finished product but it's it took about three hours to complete but uh, the reason I uh, pre-recorded it it was because um, I was working during the day, I was teaching during the day, and I could only record at night when my kids were going to sleep. Now, my little boys, uh, he's one and a half now, and he's, 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 uh, he's teething. He's got, his, uh, he's got his little baby teeth growing in, and of course, it's you know, a very uncomfortable experience for any little guy or girl, you know, so, uh, so he was very easy to wake up. He's been you know kind of waking up three or four times during the night and he's been very fussy and stuff so I didn't want to do anything to to wake him up so I decided just to paint quietly you know and listen to some music and paint quietly and uh, and just record this first part first also for the sake of not having a video that's too long I didn't want to have a video that was super super long and uh, you know I don't want you to have to sit through all of that uh, so I did want to compress it a little bit um, I'll be able to tell you later on, I haven't checked yet, but I'll, I'll be able to tell you how long it took me to paint this, although, you know, my general attitude about that is who gives a shit, right? <laughs> this is my work and I just want to have fun and produce some. I was worried about what I was producing, not how long it was taking me to do it. Um, however, I was making a very conscious point of working very quickly and loosely. Now, I was working quickly not for the sake of doing a speed painting, I was working quickly for the sake of uh, injecting a different kind of energy and movement into my piece. Uh, I wanted to, it was actually inspired very much, I mentioned, again, I mentioned this later on when I'm, when I'm actually recording live, when I'm doing it in real time, so you'll see ex the, the type of pace I was actually using for this piece. Um, it was actually inspired by Marco Bucci's work. I've been checking out his, I mentioned him in an earlier video and, and it reminded me to go and check out his work again. Um, and uh, one of his paintings in particular, he describes his, um, he describes his headspace when he's working. He kind of tries to keep this very non-committal, loose approach to his work. And the end result is something, like I love the result that he gets from his work. So I kind of inspired myself uh, based on his how he approached his painting and um, and his methodology a little bit as well you know just to just to really loosen up my brain and I find I really was really happy with how it turned out um, and loosely off of his work 
just to kind of give me a starting point, because this is something, this isn't, this isn't, it isn't a technique that I use every day. I just wanted to kind of get myself in the right headspace. But then, of course, you know, once you once you fleshed it out, once I spent the first like 15, 20 minutes fleshing out this idea, um, then then I take it off in my own direction. You know, I don't want this to be a carbon copy of, Mar of Marco's work. I want this to be my own thing, right? So, but it was definitely inspired by him. And if you check out his videos, you'll see what I'm talking about. He's a very inspiring guy, really. Uh, He's, he's, it's fun to watch him work, you know. It's fun to hear him describe things because he's a very good teacher as well. So, I suggest you go and check it out. Now, um, in working loose, one of the things I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm one of the things I'm doing, very deliberately, is uh, being very, very digital with my work, but at the same time keeping a very traditional headspace, in the sense that I'm, I want this to feel painterly. I don't want this to feel digital, quote unquote, so to speak. I generally am not a big fan of work that looks too sharp and, you know, Bezier curve and all that stuff. I like to keep it looking very organic. Um, but at the same time, I'm using tons of brushes. Generally, you know, like if you've seen my King's Harem or if you watch my Demon series, you can see it's very easy to see that I kind of try to find that brush that has that texture and feel that I like. And I, I can use that, that brush through the entire piece. Um, that's something I do very, very often. You know, it's like working with my paintbrush. That's my paintbrush for that, that painting or for that series. And uh, in this particular case, I must have used about 30 different brushes. Now, the brushes I got from, um, uh, I just purchased, um, uh, was it Dan Dos Santos? Let me just check it out here. I'll go on my thing. And, um, here. Uh, it was actually here. Let me see. It, oh no, uh, no, it's not that. Crap! Did I write it down? Dave Raposa, Dan Dos Santos. I had Dan Dos Santos in my head. Uh, Dave Raposa's new Bog Witch tutorial, and he has his uh, his brush set. Now, ninety percent of the brushes in my palette are uh, uh, are my own that I've you know picked up through different tutorials or I found them online. You know, I I, I I go through a lot of those and I, I, you know, I pick up my favorites, the stuff I actually feel I can get some use out of type of thing. Um, but then I, I, with his tutorial, I picked up a lot more, like I must have added about 20 or 25 new brushes to my, to my collection. Um, and uh, they're really, they're, some of them are awesome brushes. So I wanted to play around with some new texture brushes and, you know, uh, you know, for the, for the, sunlight i would you know i used a, a bit of an airbrush and use smoke effects brushes and i'd use paint effects brushes and rocks brushes and texture brushes and pastel brush i'm just going apeshit with it adding all kinds of texture and movement to the piece and meanwhile um if you were to see this in real time my hand is actually moving quite fast i'm just uh, using the Bezier curve tool in a lot of cases just to flesh out these very rough, loose shapes. I'm not trying to make everything perfectly symmetrical. I'm deliberately making things asymmetrical to give them that very gritty, slapped together steampunk feel, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm slapping in textures. I'm being very spontaneous with my design choices, you know, like this big circular design around the clock tower. The only thing I'm focused on, the only real thing I'm really focused on in this piece is the theme, the main focal point, and the feeling and style, which is essentially, like I said, steampunk, right? I'm thinking steampunk, and I'm thinking uh, I wanted to make the centerpiece of this entire piece of artwork this big, huge clock tower right in the middle. That's kind of like the centerpiece of the whole thing. That's why you'll notice that throughout the piece I'm adding a lot of um, I add more energy and, and uh, detail and contrast around that area to help push that focal area, right? And I have certain little secondary focal areas like like this uh, this little kind of um, kind of kooky little house there with the with the widow's peak up at the top, not the widow's peak, the uh, lover's leap up at the top, and you know a little clock on that one too. And we're going to see. I'm going to add some little lights to it after and give it, make it very moody and stuff like that. If you don't know what a lover's leap is, I actually discovered that when I took a little trip with my ex-girlfriend to uh, Thousand Islands, beautiful place. And it was a kind of like this bed and breakfast we had stayed at, and uh, they had this balcony, and a balcony 
that was on the roof that had no banister. There was no railing around it. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, somebody's going to kill themselves. And I went downstairs and I, I, I was, I, they had a little bar downstairs and I was, I was just sitting at the bar alone and I asked the guy working there, I said, what's with the balcony? And he goes, the one up on the one, the one upstairs. And I said, yeah. I said, what's with that balcony? Somebody's going to kill themselves on that. This is, this is a, a bed and breakfast after all. And he goes, no, it's a, it's, it's a historical piece. It's called a lover's leap. And I said, that's a very macabre title for something. And he goes, well, it is kind of macabre. Um, a lover's leap, if you don't know about it, um, kind of cool, kind of, to kind of give you an idea of where that world was at <laughs> back in the, in the day is, uh, um, when, when women would stay home and men would go off to battle, you know, they would very often sailors and stuff like that. They would travel out overseas and they'd be gone for like six months to a year, you know, be gone for a very long time. Uh, where I don't know if this is true, you know, but this is at least how he described it to me, um, where women could go into these depressions or if they lost their husband at war or overseas, you know, like if he was killed at war or something like that. Um, a lover's leap, this lover's leap was basically a, like a, you could call it a diving board off the top of your house where, you know, a, a, where a woman would leap to her death in a in a fit of depression you know and i thought that's pretty messed up so i just thought that was kind of neat because that's the kind of stuff that you know people are so freaking safety conscious these days you never see something like that designed you know that would never be a part of architecture but i thought what a crazy concept you know so that always kind of stuck with me i mean this is something that is we're going back about like 15 years or something like that or longer i don't know a long time ago, but you know, it's just something that always kind of stuck in the back of my head. I thought, that is really crazy. So I decided to throw a little lover's leap, but of course, in my case, I'm such a modern wimp that I had to add a banister to it, but whatever. You get the point. It's the whole point of having that balcony up on the rooftop that you can jump off with type of kooky idea. Um, now, I was inspired by several things, and I'm going to mention this in further detail later on, but essentially, there was, you know, the, the, the original premise behind this painting approach was inspired by Marco Bucci, and then I had. I was very inspired um, uh, uh, design-wise by the game Machinarium, uh, which you can go and check out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be posting that in my forum, in the actual uh, forum chat, so you can go and check it out there. You can check it out. It's a really, 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 really cool game. Uh, and the approach, the design approach that they use it is really gorgeous stuff. And the soundtrack is kick-ass, too, if you want some moody uh, music to listen to while you're painting your own your own steampunky village because it's got a very it's very steampunky music it's really brilliant stuff and a very you know kind of a, a non-mainstream video game for originally for pc but now you can get it for your iphone um but in any case or for your mobile phone at least um so yeah so it's kind of the what set me off in this direction and that's uh, uh you'll see that i started with my value pass but then just to get myself just to throw myself right into color because a lot of this piece is about being playful with color, um, is I, I went online and I started looking up some, I just grabbed some images off of Google of rust. You know, like rusty paint chipped surfaces and just slapped it right in. And you'll notice like how I'm using my, my, blending, my blending options. I'm picking, I'm flipping through the blending options and landing on the one that I find looks the coolest. That's really as technical as I'm getting in that respect. You know, uh, everything I'm doing is, is very improv. It's very spontaneous. Uh, you know, I have, this is one of the brushes I got from, um, from Marposa's brush set, uh, which is huge, by the way, it's like, there's like 300 freaking brushes, if not more. It took me like an hour to, to pick the one, pick and choose the ones that I wanted to keep, you know, but this is kind of like a perspective ground plane kind of organic ground plane kind of texture that I just slapped on just to add a little suggestion of a, of, you know, a ground. And, um, and yeah, so I just slap that in and, you know, then I go more, I do a little bit more fleshing out some neat quirky shapes with my busy tool, cutting in, you know, pushing and pulling, cutting out, adding very sculptorly type of approach to it. Um, and just keeping my attitude very loose about the whole thing. Right, and as you can see at this particular point on the timeline here, I'm at 14 minutes, which means I'm probably around. I'm almost. I'm actually probably coming around an hour's worth of painting at this particular point, 
And you can see that, you know, even if you go back about half an hour, within the first 15, 20 minutes of this painting, I had already established whether or not I was on the track I wanted to keep going on. That's something I generally like to establish really early on when I'm doing a painting, you know. The detail, the fleshing out, all of that stuff, that's a question of choice. But that is really up to either my personal desire or the desire of my client, right? If my client says we really want to have something heavy, heavily detailed, then I'll just spend more time on it. You know, it's a very good way to gauge how much you charge a client, depending on how much detail they want. Like very often, for instance, a client might say, they'll, which I generally prefer is that a client will say, for instance, you know, well, I do and I don't, depending. Sometimes a client will offer you some image reference. You know, they'll say like, oh, we're working on a certain game or working on a certain thing. Here's a certain, here's a couple of examples of kind of stuff we're, we're, we like, you know. Sometimes they really want to be committal to that style and sometimes not. That's something important to establish with the client because uh, you don't know if, uh, you know, if they're looking for something extremely specific and it's, they're referencing some really skilled artist who has a lot of training, a lot of practice and background in that particular style of artwork, then you might not be suited for that, right? So you kind of have to say, okay, it looks like you're somebody who's really, really specialized in this type of artwork, and that's really not my thing. If you're looking me to, to really deliver you something quickly, I probably won't be able to deliver it on time. That'll cost you money. So, you know, what I, what I do in that particular case is I, ref, I, I refer them to other artists that I feel are more qualified for that job, you know. But, uh, um, but it's a good way to gauge. But sometimes they'll say, like, here's an image reference, but I'm looking for something looser, or I'm looking for something grungier, or I'm looking for something more fairy fantasy based. They'll kind of, they'll try to offer you the best reference in that particular case. And that, in that case, you can kind of gauge, um, at that point, uh, how, how long it's going to take you, you know, depending on what they're looking for, how comfortable you are with that particular type of artwork. Of course, if you're completely uncomfortable and don't, my suggestion is don't, don't accept the job because you're going to screw it up and you're going to, you know, you're going to cost money and time that, and, and it also comes at the cost of your professional reputation too, if you do that too often, you know, but, um, but don't stress out over that stuff too much. But yeah, it's, it's like if he says, for instance, you know, we're looking for something like this, but something a lot more refined and detailed. And to me, the word refinement and detail equals time. But that's really what consumes the most time. If he, if your client is just looking for a really, really quick, rough concept, just as a presentation piece, you know, like I've done artwork for like, let's say like uh, advertising companies and stuff like that. You know, I remember in one particular case, this guy hired me to do uh, to do a couple of little illustrations and stuff like that. And he said, but keep it loose, keep it loose because if, and I said, well, if you're paying me, if you're paying me a, you know, a decent sum of money to produce something, I'll, I'll, why don't I just do something nice for you? You know, why don't I, you know, I can send you the rough concept, but then I can do a cleaner, nice colored version of it. And he says, no, I don't want that. I'm not interested. I'll pay you the same amount. Just keep it loose. And I was really like, I didn't understand, you know, why he wanted that it was because some clients, my friend, my friend who actually worked there, the one who had referred me to that job told me it's because, uh, in the case of advertising or any kind of studio work, this is a long time ago, but in the case of certain types of start studio work, if you show, if they show their client work that's too refined, the client might interpret that as a pitch, like as it, as this is what it's actually going to look like, right? And they don't, and a studio doesn't necessarily want to bottle the neck themselves into a into an established design. They want to just say, "This is my idea." blah, blah, blah. Here's a little illustration in the background, I'm gonna, just to add ambiance to it, but it's nothing specific. And that keeps their pitch open-ended for experimentation, which is very important when you work in, in that kind of field. You know, whether you work in film or advertising or whatever the case might be, you know, so I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Um, and I, and I, just for the sake of argument, because the, you know, advertising very often pays well. So, you know, I, um, you know, so I, I did offer him something. I, I, I slapped in a little Easter egg for him and said, oh, well, if you ever want to use something a little cleaner, then here you go. Because I had a little bit more time to work on it. So I provided him with it. And he was like, oh, thanks. Cool. And he paid me. And I went on with my life. And then I realized uh, a couple weeks later that he actually scrapped. He just flat out scrapped the uh, the clean version. He kept only the rough version. And I think he even had a buddy of his to to paint over my what looked a little bit too clean line 
you know, because it's just my style when it came to cartooning at the time, you know. And he, he painted over it to make it look really crappy, <laughs> you know. The whole emphasis was he should have just said, Adam, make it look crappy. And I would have just said, all right, crappy you want, crappy you get. You're the boss, you know. So it's kind of funny. But, like, um, if somebody says, I want detail, you got to think, okay, well, what level of detail? How far do you want to push the refinement of this piece? Like, you know what I mean? And he goes, oh, I want to be able, like, I said, like, I'll ask them questions like, like when you say detail, do you mean like you want to look inside a little window and see a little character in there holding a frying pan, bake, making bacon, you know, frying up some bacon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like really, it's a heavy, heavy detail. Okay, well, I know that that can mean the difference between me spending six hours on a painting or spending three weeks on a painting. You know what I'm saying? So like that to me translates into hours. Right, so that can be uh, one little trick you can use to help gauge uh, how much to charge for freelance work. This is something I very—it's a very common practice. And you get the more you do it, the more you kind of kind of get the feel for you know how long it'll take certain pieces of artwork to do. But there's always you know when you're more of a beginner, you're somebody who's starting out and you haven't done this. The whole idea of how much to ask for money can be a really intimidating thing, you know. So I'm not going to get into specifics about salary and all that kind of stuff because that's all relative, right? And that also depends, salary also depends on who you're working for. Different companies, different peoples, different in, di, di, different, different uh, individuals will um, have different budgets flat out, you know? So it's very important to get to know your client, whether it be a studio or whether it be a private studio or, you know, like just a private business or whatever the case might be. What's this look around at the type of work they produced before you speak to them and find out what kind of what kind of work they produce and if you can see that it's a lot of high-end stuff you know like if you look at their website and you can tell they paid a graphic designer handsomely to design this really awesome sexy looking website chances are they've got a budget you know so you can go you can work that into your negotiation when you're when you're when you're uh, negotiating salaries with the client, but then you look at somebody and you know, like they kind of puts they slap together their own little HTML page for, for on their own because they couldn't afford to pay a graphic designer, and you know, but they're willing to offer you you know a respectable fee for your work, but you know don't go overboard. Then you can say okay, you know you can you can be a little bit lenient more lenient with them because you can see, you know it's a project you really something you really enjoy doing and it's something that can add to your portfolio. You're getting paid for it, so every so it's all on the up and up in that respect, you know. You gauge it that way, you know. But a lot of people, a lot of artists, one of the things that they very often overlook, and one of the things they they don't do enough of, and this is something I encourage both my students and you know people I know that come to me for uh, you know like freelance advice because it's very difficult to get advice sometimes is research spend half an hour and go on, you know, Google this company and try to find out what kind of, check out the projects they've worked on, try to see if you can find out what kind of artists worked on their project, you know, and trying to get a little idea of what they're, what they do. So, you, and that'll help you figure out a, whether or not you're qualified for the work, B, what their expectations are and C, the type of budget they have. So that can help you with negotiating a salary. That's a very effective tool, you know? So it's just a little food for thought. If you're, if you're, if you're, pitching to clients and stuff like that kind of idea all right uh, now just to get back to the painting here you'll see that I've um, um, yeah, I'm seeing if I'm gonna crop it here the detail that I'm adding in is really loose and I'm at this particular point I grabbed this one particular brush that I really like I can't remember where I got it from but it's it's a brush that is 100% opaque there's no uh, pressure there's the the opacity jitter is off Okay, so it's when I whether I paint hard or light, it's I'm always going to get thick opaque paint. Okay, and um, and there's a little bit of a size jitter to it, but I'm essentially the reason I'm using this is because I want to uh, grab colors and create sharp edges. You know, because I'm working quickly and I'm throwing in very loose details. Um, I want to capture, I don't want to work with a, too much pressure sensitivity because then I'm, I, I can start softening up edges that are in the distance and that can make my forms look very weak and it can just make everything look a little too cloudy for my taste. You know, you want to keep things readable even if they're done very loosely. But if you actually look close up, if you actually zoom in and look close up, you can see that a lot of these lights and suggestions of forms is just like a, a streak, a wiggle 
you know uh, I'm being very loose with all of this stuff so that's just something really uh, something to take into account uh, working with opaque paint offers you that and at the same time you'll notice that I'm constantly altering I'm constantly uh, goofing off a little bit with my color choices so like in the in the area where the lights hitting the ground and it's catching off the top of the bottom of those little buildings in the midground um, you'll notice I'm throwing in pinks and then I'll lean towards yellows and blues and greens and I'm bouncing around to create this nice play of color and that really is kind of um, probably this it's not really a secret I mean, people have been doing it for years, but it's really the trick to creating a lot of energy and vibrance in your piece. This is something that, again, Marco Bucci mentions in his tutorials. Um, Nathan Fawkes um, also is all about, you know, being loose and crazy with color. You know, being brave, being experimental, throwing in, being very, you know, being very wild with your color choices, you know. Um, and being brave, but using a certain artistic sensibility to make sense of it. You know what I mean? Like, don't just don't just throw in color for the sake of color. Try to use it. Try to use your intuition. Make it tasteful, but don't uh, but don't you know? Don't be afraid to throw blue across somebody's face, or throw a pink light and then next to a yellow light, and blue smoke and green smoke and yellow smoke, and you know, throw in all this ambiance and energy. That little you know, when I applied that rust texture and I played around with the hue it created this, vi this vibrant violet blue patch across the middle of that clock I kept it I didn't go ooh I got to erase that out no I kept it I liked it I like this, this neat little bounce of color and it also helps push the focal area around that clock tower right which is a very important uh, uh, narrative element and focal point of the piece so I kept that and next to that you'll notice I'm grabbed some of those rusty colors and that particular layer was uh, where I painted in that slightly darker red that streaks down under the the clock tower that will be adjusted because I can see that it's off kilter here um, but it was set to a blending option a blending mode that kind of deepened the color and had a bit of saturation totally unintentional it was totally by happenstance but I was like oh it works go with it you know like an improv, like like an improv, you just just go with it, just go with it. And I kept telling myself that, just move, keep moving forward, don't move back. Um, and it, it it very quickly injected a lot of energy into this piece, a lot. You know, it was really a, it was really a very emotionally liberating way to work. I really enjoyed working this way. It was really cool. As you can see here, um, I'm bouncing around everywhere, and I've mentioned this in other tutorials as well. You know, I mentioned this in, in King's Harem. I mentioned this in other tutorials. Um, when I paint something, I'm not. I I make a very strong point of not hyper focusing in on a single point. I'm constantly. I'll add some details and then I'll, I'll allow my eyes to travel around the piece and say, okay, how can I balance this in with something else? Do I need to cool things off here, move things around there, change the angle, all these things? Because I'm thinking about the entire composition as a whole, right? It's like a song. Um, uh, there's a rhythm, there's an energy to certain types of music, right? Certain types of, ener certain types of music are very um, uh, melodic, very... Uh, uh, very serene it travels on a wave it's gentle it's soft other ones that are very uh, staccato very rhythmic very fast-paced very sharp and some are very dark and gritty and, and dirty you know like if I was to compare three types three types of music in reference to different approaches to how you would paint compare La Boheme to uh, every time I always forget this guy's name Jesus I have to look at my iPhone you're gonna see later on I do the same bloody thing I keep forgetting this guy's name I don't know why I listen to him like 50,000 times a day but I still keep forgetting his bloody name there's ah, Tom Waits <laughs> I have to look at my iPhone for that compare La Boheme to Tom Waits to uh, Looney Tunes to, you know, to Sound of Music 
and think about the different rhythm and feel for each one of those different. It's they're worlds apart, right? Compare that to Celtic music. Compare that to salsa. Compare that to swing. You know, every one of these has a totally different headspace. And what each one of these types of music do, whenever you, depending on the type of music you feel like listening to at that particular time, is it's bringing you into that world, right? They're creating a world for you. They're establishing what the rhythm, the pace, and the mood is, you know? Uh, what is Pantera telling you when you listen to the music versus Megadeth? They're both, you know, they're both, I hate the term heavy metal, such a freaking corny name, you know? It's like bullshit hardcore, you know, but compare like Pantera to Megadeth. Yeah, they're both heavy metal, quote unquote, but there's a slightly different message going on. There's a slightly different feel. And Megadeth's world is their template. It's their color scheme. It's their texture, right? Versus Pantera that has a very different texture. The cleanliness of their music compared to, you know, to a, compared to a different band, you know, like Sepultura. They're going to have a, Sepultura is a little bit muddier. Uh, Pantera is a little bit cleaner, sharper. It's like a sharp chiseled edge, you know. Megadeth is a little blunter. There's a little, but there's always a little bit more of a different texture to that different type of music. And when you're painting something, in this particular case, what's the texture of this piece? The texture of this piece is dirty, gritty, jagged, yet colorful, playful. Okay. Um, it's loose, it's fast, it's wild, it's um, exaggerated, it's all of these things. These are all the words, these key phrases, these tempos that I'm thinking of that are popping into my head as I start to flesh out this piece. And I'm sticking myself to that, I'm reminding myself constantly of this um, headspace, of this little tempo that I'm creating and that's going to continue to translate through all the way to the end but I have established that tempo within the first 10 minutes of the piece and if I if I can look at that very very wild completely undefined block in in grayscale and say there we go I feel that then I can go with that and I can keep elaborating on it and adding to it until it becomes until it becomes a fully detailed illustrated piece of artwork Okay. Now, in terms of detail, going back to that whole, you know, working on contract and how far do you push detail, this piece, as it stands right now, depending on what the client is looking for, could be, I could be done. I could say, okay, you wanted something very loose. How's this? Ah, perfect. I just wanted you to establish the mood. Thanks. Good. You know, here's your paycheck. Get out of my face. Right. Um, or I could show this and they can say, I love the idea. Now I want you to really flesh it out. Cool. I know how much longer it's going to take for me to do that. I already can gauge if I keep working with the same rhythm, if I keep working with the same feeling, I can gauge, okay, I know that it'll take me another five, six hours, or I know it'll take me another two, three days, or I know it'll take me a month, you know, <laughs> depending on just what level of detail they're, they're looking for, you know. Of course, I have yet to ever encounter a client who could afford paying me for a month's worth of work on a single piece of artwork. So of course, when working on this kind of stuff, you, you know, uh, the most I'll generally, the longest I've ever spent on, on a single piece of artwork is about a week, uh, at full time hours. So we're talking nine to five, Monday to Friday, right? A five day work week, uh, on a single piece of artwork, but that's rare. You know, the turnaround that's generally asked of me is at most a couple of days i usually range between you know if it's you know if it's just silly quick work you know just a quick character sketch and stuff like that that i might spend two hours on it but or even less but the average turnaround is between a day and three days altogether you know because generally the people the, the clients that hire me hire me for illustration work they hired me to do something a little bit more fleshed out or a character that's really been worked or a series of characters so two to three days is you know, about an average for me, for my type of work. Okay. When I'm working in a studio, that's actually very different because when I'm working in a studio, I'm generally working with an artistic director that knows what they want and they understand their artists themselves. So they generally understand uh, the concepting phase. They can look at something that's super rough and 
and and be able to say, oh, okay, I know where you're going with this. That'll work. that'll do. You can go ahead and do the final, right? In which case, I spend I can spend 20, 30 minutes on a concept, and that'll do, you know. And then from that point, I just take it and I and I, you know, then I work on a nice final clean sketch. If it's something, if it's asked of me, or something at least that the 3D animators can can understand, so they can uh, so they can work with it. You know what I mean? So they can actually, it's something that, that 3D, 3D modelers will be able to understand and, and, and work with, right? Um, but if you look at the piece as we stand, as it stands right now, this is already, to me, you know, I don't know, you might not feel the same way, but to me, this is already fun. I'm already having fun. I'm already starting to look at this and go, ooh, this is cool. I like where this is going. Um, even though it's very spontaneous and loose, I, I like this little kind of spooky, spooky, dark, gritty, dirty, uh, steampunky village you know, city that I cityscape that I've got going on. It kind of, it's almost like a steam, a filthy steampunk version of Shibuya Tokyo. You know, I have a. If you check out my portfolio, you'll see I have a, an illustration I did for a video game company of Shib like an abandoned Shibuya village. You know, kind of brought me back into that whole epic scale Shibuya thing going on, which I always thought I thought was really cool. It was a fun project too. I had a lot of fun, a lot of fun working on it. So you see what I'm saying? And I, you know, for the sake of creating a bit of a fantasy landscape, I, I create a second smaller moon. You know, I didn't just, uh, I, you know, I wanted to do some, I, I keep thinking of, you know, spontaneously, you know, throw in another moon, throw in another planet, you know, kind of the type of concept work you'd see for, you know, a very good example, if you were to reference something for that would be the concept artwork for World of Warcraft. You know, like if, if you ever played, if you played um, uh, Burning Crusade, Burning Crusade, where they had the where they had the outlines, you know, and you go into Hellfire Peninsula, and there's like, you know, it's this big barren red, rocky landscape, and then when you look up at the sky, it's this black sky with like kind of these colorful clouds, you know, these colorful kind of celestial Milky Way clouds, and like about if you if you scope around and you turn your camera around, scoping out the the landscape, you can see like all these different color planets off in outer space is really that kind of headspace, you know, and just, you can tell the concept artists kind of, we're in a very similar headspace to where I am coming up with these ideas here. You know, they work very loosely. You know, the, I love the work that they do at Blizzard. They, they really have some really top-notch artists working there. Um, so yeah, so you kind of see where I'm going with that. Now, I, when I threw in the moons, I thought, well, it'd be cool to add in a, another source of cool light to balance the warm light coming in uh, kind of shafting in through the right, so I decided to grab a little bit of that blue violet and uh, and and throw that and slap that onto those buildings in the back to a help them pop and b have a little bit of color variation there. Um, and I'm being very you know very loose about the color and very loose about the shapes. You look close up, it's some very rough looking shapes, but I'm I'm still at this point in the painting thinking very much in terms of um, very much in terms of uh, uh, of getting all the information there, all the lighting, the shapes, the things, and I'm doing it really fast. I just want to. I keep adding content, adding content. I'm not thinking about refining anything. Just add, add, add. Build, build, build. You know, and then once I get to that point, I just I spend a little bit of time at the, at the end of this tutorial just refining it. You know, just adding a little bit of refinement where need be. You can see right here. I decided to add, use a, a, a new texture brush. I was experimenting with a new texture brush to uh, to, to hit the lighting off of this building, just kind of because I liked it because it kind of gave it this kind of pitted metallic surface feel to it. So I decided to use that. Uh, it's the first time I've ever used it. You're witnessing me use this brush for the first time, and you can tell that the brush probably has a dissolve effect added to it to give it that very, you know, very opaque pixelated look to it. You know? And I like that. It gave it a very nice hard hard texture to it very gritty metal um, so in that and I'm doing that but then I'm using my airbrush to create the fall off right to create a little fall off of light so it's kind of that you know mixed media thing you know a soft uh, a hard brush a hard pixelated brush with a very soft edged eraser to create a nice smooth fall off so it creates this nice gradient adding a little bit of a bluer saturation making it a little bit more saturated in the foreground just to, you know, to uh, have it push forward a little bit more and give the illusion that it's closer than those more slightly green cyan cliff sides off in the background. See what I'm saying? 
here, I decided I've already started adding in those windows and stuff, and I thought, you know, I need a little bit more detail to pull our eye and a bit of a directional element to pull our eye towards the, uh, the clock terror. And I just transformed it straight so that I could scale it. And I add a few little windows there. And these are all directional elements that are pulling your eye towards that big clock. You know, that big kind of steampunky clock with the pipe sticking out of it. You can tell like it's a steam-powered clock. I like that idea, you know. Um, steampunk is fun, by the way. It's It gets those creative juices flowing. And you can tell a lot of artists like that, too, because whenever I've been to, like, the Montreal Comic Con or I've been to different cons and stuff like that, you've always got that those couple of guys that show up in this, like, like epic steampunk costume you know i remember the last uh, montreal con i went to was uh <laughs> this guy I, I was in line with my daughter you know number 8422 at the end of the line god good lord there was a lot of people there but like uh there were people walking around in costumes you know your typical uh, your typical stuff you see at a con and stuff and this guy uh <laughs> This guy comes by in, like I'm telling you, man, the most in, the most phenomenal steampunk costume I've ever seen in my life. He had these, like, real brass pipes, goggles, and, you know, worn brown leather straps. And I, he just walked by me. He had this kind of, like, tele, this like vintage telephone strapped onto his chest type of thing. I was sitting there going, you, oh, God, marry me now, you know? <laughs> it was so cool. And my daughter was like, oh, my God, Daddy, you got to check this out, check this out. And I was like, yeah, no, I see that, you know. And, of course, following shortly behind him is this girl in a, in a sexy cat costume or some superhero costume stuff, you know. So that was, my eyes kind of diverted off of that, you know, whatever. No, I didn't. I'm a gentleman. But in any case, you know, there's a, it's so much fun, man. These people really go all out at the cons to really make it fun. To me, cosplay is really honestly one of the things that make cons so much fun you know there's the cosplay and then there's also the uh um there's the uh the art artwork you know getting to meet other artists and and people who share the same passion getting to know other people it's just hugely awesome for that i missed the last con unfortunately but i want to actually get my work into the next one at least in montreal you know i've got a busy schedule and all that stuff but uh it's worth it it's worth me it's worth putting time aside for uh to get involved see here i'm as far as the shapes that I've just injected in, you notice how I'm just kind of like, I'm not you, I'm, I'm rarely using, you know, the shift key to create straight edges. I want to create deliberately uh, uh, wonky edges. So I'm just etching it in and I'm really not worrying about, you know, whether something makes sense per se. I'm just kind of going with it adding these little shapes here, I kind of had the idea of having this kind of like castle up at the top of this cliff, this crooked cliff with a bit of a, a bridge thing going on, you know, I kind of, later on, I, I couldn't really get it to work the way I wanted to, so I, I think I paint over that and I fixed it up, I changed it to something else later on, but it's kind of the idea I was going with, but, you know, it took me, what, 20 seconds, so, you know, these are, these aren't, these aren't minutes I'm worried about never getting back type of idea, because I'm, I'm, being experimental and I'm learning in the process. That's all good. Actually, while we're on the whole, uh, I was just thinking, while we're on the whole Comic-Con thing, um, a lot of artists, a lot of you guys listening probably attend cons and probably, you know, you might be artists that actually, uh, you know, rent out tables and present your artwork and stuff like that as well, which is freaking awesome. And, you know, if we ever get a chance to meet, let me know. You know, let me know that, you know, you've, you've, you've seen my stuff online and introduce yourself and um, so that we know that we kind of have a common ground there. I know that you all know where you, where we actually, you know, where we act, we'll, we'll make, we'll put context to our, to our new friendship type of thing. Um, but uh, one little thing to say, if you're, if you're somebody who's looking to do a con or, you know, you want to, you want to enter a comic con uh, or some comic event or some art event or whatever the case might be where you actually present your own work and, you know, you have your old setup. This is something I actually had a conversation with my Jimmy, my, my Jimmy, <laughs> with my Jimmy, with my friend Jimmy about, cause he's a comic artist and he like, when he goes to cons, he has a, you know, he has a hell of a setup, you know, he has freaking flags up with his artwork and, he, he really invests in his presentations. He's actually, if you ever come to the Montreal Con, he's actually the guy who designed the logo for the Comic-Con. You know, it's pretty awesome stuff. He actually did that. And, uh, you know, every time, I, every time I go to a con or I see an advertisement for it and I see his artwork, I get a little giddy, you know. He's like, my Jimmy did that, you know. 
but uh, you know, but uh, we were we were sitting down having a we were having one. Uh, I make reference to this later on in the tutorial uh, when I'm when I'm filming it live. But uh, uh, we have our, our our weekly bitch and slurps, right? Where we sit in the cafe, we have our coffee, and we talk about life and blah blah blah. And uh, and uh, we were talking about comic cons, and we were talking about a pet peeve that a lot that we have. Um, which, you know, I'm not saying this to be a whiner. I'm saying this actually for educational purposes. If you're an artist that's that's presenting at a Comic-Con, um, then you're there to meet people. You're there to make acquaintances. You're there to, you know, to present your stuff. You're there to schmooze. You're there to make connections. You're there to make friends. And a lot of artists that go there, it's kind of, it was, it's not as bad today as it used to be, but I find very often artists will kind of rent out a table. They'll pay money to rent out a table. They'll bring the work and they'll just sit there with their nose in their sketchbook for six hours, you know? And if they're, when you don't make eye contact with people, people generally won't feel so compelled to approach you, you know? It's kind of like, it kind of just looks like he just wants to be left alone type of thing. And also when people see, other people might interpret that as, well, dude, if, you, if you're not going to look at me, I'm not even going to bother, you know, coming to check you out, you know. But they'll just sit there with their nose in their sketchbook and they'll just sketch. And, you know, and you'll come by and you go, oh, hey, you know, if you're, if you're outgoing enough, because that'll deter any shy person, you know. But if you're outgoing enough to actually walk up to them and say, hey, nice work. I really like what you're working on. Can you mind if I look at your sketchbook? And they kind of like, they don't even look up. They just kind of lift the book and then put it back down and keep sketching. My attitude about that is, dude, why the hell did you come here in the first place? You know, why did you waste your money so you could sit there and act like an idiot? You know, that's, you know, I'm being very candid with you about my opinion. But that's, that, that's essentially what... I think, and what a lot of people think, you know, like, why come to a con? Why go out of your way to do that just to act like a <clears throat> douchebag, right? Uh, or a, douche, a douchebagette, because girls are just as bad as that sometimes, you know? But, uh, of course, you know, at cons, you know, as far as artists are concerned, you know, when I was younger, is usually a lot more guys. I was actually changing quickly, which is awesome. You know, I like seeing a lot more female artists out there, but, um, and they're, they can usually outdo any guy because they have a lot of there's a lot of skill that comes with the feminine touch. You know, I try to inject that into my work a lot, but um, but that's the thing, you know. And they just sit there with their nose in their book and they kind of brush you off, you know, like man, I'm busy, you know. And it and I'm talking, I'm not just talking about guys that are, you know, newer. I'm talking about you know guys who have a nice portfolio. They got some nice work, you know, and. Out of all of every single one of those guys, whether I was just attending or whether I was, uh, you know, whether I was attending and I was presenting my own work or if I was, uh, whether I was presenting my own work or, was I, or whether I was actually just a, a visitor, you know, I don't remember any of them. Like, I just went, oh, okay, fine. And I kept walking. The ones I remember, the ones I talk to today, the ones who I share ideas with, the ones who I collaborate with are the ones that they won't let you leave their table. Like an awesome example of this is an amazing artist, comic. Uh, he's a graphic novel artist as well. He's very stylized work. Very, I'd say like, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure who to compare him to because I don't know the comic industry as much as I know the the you know the concept art industry and stuff. Uh, Richard Sarau, um, check him out. You'll see what I'm talking about. He's got some pretty hardcore stuff out there, and. I met him for the first time at a con. I wasn't presenting. I was just there actually just sitting at the table with my friend Jimmy. He was the one who was presenting that year. I was just a guest, you know. And uh, I was walking around, touring different tables and stuff like that. And Richard's sitting at the table. And I swear to God, he wouldn't let one person walk by without saying hi to him. He's just so warm and welcoming and he would if one person came up and approached his table while he was talking to one person he would kind of like hold the sleeve of the second guy like uh, state hey how are you doing i'll get back to you he ended up having like a following of 50 people sitting around his table why because he treated people like they freaking mattered the whole reason he was there in the first place was to connect with these people and he was connecting you know, and he was so friendly and he would, he would, his con when he would have conversation with people, you know, at first it's just an informal introduction, but by the time you're finished talking to him, you were having a very personal conversation with the guy because he was interested in you. You know, he asked me questions about me. He engaged me in the conversation. He just didn't just sit back and wait for me to praise him. 
you know. Although he got plenty of praise from a lot of people because his artwork's gorgeous. But that's he was there to, hey, let's be friends. You know, that was kind of his attitude. It wasn't just a hi, potential business partner. Would you like to engage in conversation for a short brief for for a brief moment? Why, thank you. Well, your time is up. I'll move on to the next one so I can, you know, accumulate the largest number of followers possible. No, he really took his time with each person and like, you know, gave himself to everybody. And what's the deal? You know, 10 years later, here we are, we're still buddies and we're, you know, and we share ideas and he gets a lot of support from me in the industry. You know, Jimmy's the same idea. He, he, he. He's approachable. He would crack. He's, he's, very, he's probably the funniest guy on earth. I don't know anybody in the world funnier than him. And I watch a lot of comedy. You know, people are laughing, having a good time. You know, now if you're a shy person, you know, if you're a shy artist, and you have a tendency to like, you, you're you're a bit socially awkward. You know, which is like 99% of artists out there, right? If that's the case, then. Here's a trick for you. This is something I found a lot of Shire artists do that makes them very approachable and takes the attention off of them. Because I like shy people. You know, I have a real soft spot for shy people like because I identify with it. You know, I'm not shy, but I can identify with it. I really find it's a very wonderful quality in people. But like there's a few people I met that were very shy. You know, like you just say hi to them and their face beats just flushes red, you know. And what they would do is they redirect the conversation. That's very clever. They redirect the conversation to you. You know, you come up, you say, ooh, I really like your work. And they go, oh, thanks. You know, this little guy, and he's all skinny. He's like, oh, <laughs> oh God, what do I do? You know, and I'm 6'3", you know, say, hey, how are you doing? And he just shits his pants, you know. <laughs> I was like really nervous, you know. And I come up to him and go, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I love your work, you know. And, and he goes, oh, thanks. He goes, oh, are you an artist too? Bang. You know, and he got me talking. So I said, yeah, I'm an artist too, and I do concept art, and I work in video games. Well, oh, awesome. Do you have any work online? He kept me talking. He kept the conversation on me. He, you know, and I'd say, yeah, I do this. Have you ever worked in video games? No, not yet, but I'd love to. What kind of video games did you work on? You know, it's like, he clever bastard. And at the end of that, I was like, I had a great conversation with him, and I did all the talking. And I walked away going, you sneaky bastard, you made me do all the work and I still like you, you know? So there's a good trick if you're a bit shyer. You don't, you, you, pre you, you prepare the conversation to be about them. And when you, when, when you're shy, and I've, you know, I've had my very nervous shy moments in my life too. Not so much anymore, of course. You get, you kind of get over that after a while or you don't, whatever, it doesn't matter. But when you have that shy thing one of the things that make you the most nervous is how do i engage conversation with people and the reason why you might be feeling nervous is because you're putting all the pressure of the talk on yourself okay and um when you redirect it to them you get them talking and then they ask you questions and they're feeding the conversation themselves right so you just go like hey you're an artist too great opening line at a con you're an artist too no you're not an artist oh well you really seem to appreciate it you know, and it might feel a little informal at the beginning, but as soon as you break the ice with them, then it becomes a real authentic conversation. And that's where you really start to develop some really awesome connections and friendships with people, you know, either be business or be it personal, you know, it's a really half, half deal, you know, but you really, because you're, because you, you're all there for the same thing. You're there because you love comics. You're there because you love fantasy. You're there because you love whatever, you know, you love cosplay then you all have a commonality. You all love video games. So you don't talk about art. You talk about, you know, you talk about Call of Duty. You talk about Fable. You talk about WoW, you know. You end up getting into a conversation about something else, and art will come into it eventually. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to put all that pressure of, like, talk art, talk art. You know, so just, you know, if you're shy, get other people to do the talking. Now, where else is this an awesome technique? Okay, and that is in a job interview. Okay, in a job interview. You know, I was talking about researching clients, research companies and clients also when it comes to doing an interview. Uh, not only for the sake of just, you know, understanding the company better and having something of quality to talk about, but it gives you good questions to ask. And what I, when, if we put questions in the context of a conversational starter, um, that company has a lot to say about the product. You know, they're very passionate about what they do. And 
if you take the time to actually get to know what they do and you know if there's any YouTube videos with interviews and stuff like that get to know them a little bit better check them out on on LinkedIn this isn't a lot of work you know you can do all of this kind of research very quickly it can take you a couple of hours you walk into the interview um, people are very often very nervous because it's like oh boy I hope I answer these questions right instead of approaching it that way you interview them okay you interview them you go like oh well, you know like you know like there's one studio I remember I was working for I was like oh I saw your interview on on blah 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 on the thing you know like uh, when you did that project that was you know that was really cool how did you get into that or you know like what how do you know where did you what did you do that led to doing this like relevant questions that you know that they can give you a solid answer to you know but prepare a few questions for them and let them do the talking you know and follow those questions up with more questions and very often what happens is it shows a that you're very interested in the company right it's not all about you 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 because everybody's always trying to say look at how good I am People, employers always know that everybody's trying to show off and be the best one for the job but they also want to see that you gel well with the company you know like you've got the type of person that fits with the company so if you can authentically and honestly ask questions based on stuff you're interested of because it is a company you're interested in working for asking a lot of questions and by the end of the interview they go wow this this interview really went well I really enjoyed the conversation and you're you're kind of sitting there in the back of your head going well the conversation was all you buddy <laughs> you did all the talking you know but you're giving me all the credit for the con for this great conversation and I must have said like five words during the whole interview you know and once you've loosened up the air then when it comes to answering real interview questions you're in your zone you're in a comfortable place. You're kind of you're on more of a you know on a first name basis with them, to a certain degree. You know you don't necessarily want to jump on a first name basis with the general manager. You know, but um, you know what I mean. You've warmed it up. You've gotten the ball rolling, and your thought process is going. So you're not sitting there and impress them, impress them headspace, which could be very stressful. Right. So yeah, that's a little bit of something. So I think we're about to finish up part one here. I think we got a couple of minutes left. So yeah. I'll let you watch the last uh, couple more minutes of a uh, couple more seconds of this painting and we'll jump into part two. So as you can see, we were about three hours into the painting and we were a good parts in. We've done a lot of good work, so we're well on our way. <laughs> 